Hello, and welcome to everybody to the first of three panels taking place during Alumni Week at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Today, we are here for a crisis compounded, how the global pandemic is creating greater humanitarian challenges. Before we jump in, I wanna make some introductions and take care of some housekeeping. My name is Natalie Myers. I'm a Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health class of 2013 master's graduate from the Global Health and Population Program. I'm currently the director of Global Advocacy in Africa Program with a nonprofit called Resurge International, where we work to build surgical capacity in low-income countries. I also serve as the secretary of the Harvard Chan School Alumni Association. This year, Alumni Weekend is virtual, obviously, and I'm calling in from California um, and will be taking place all week long. While we wish we could be in Boston together, we're happy that we're able to have alumni participate from all over the world. And one of our panelists, Dr. Subra, is even calling in from Australia. So thank you for the 1 a.m., Dr. Subra. Throughout this week's programming, you'll hear about the Harvard Chan Frontiers. These are five of the school's strategic and research priorities, and they include reimagining aging overcoming violence, confronting climate change, cultivating well-being and nutrition, and conquering epidemics. You'll see information about the, the frontiers in the chat as well as in follow-up emails. I also want to take this moment to recognize and thank the alumni of the Harvard Chan School who have stepped up and supported school in this time during a global public health crisis. We have raised over $69 million for the school, which goes towards research, student scholarships, and financial aid. In addition, alumni gifts have gone to the COVID-19 response fund and the student emergency fund, helping to support students caught in pandemic-related financial crises. We'll also include a link in the chat box where you can learn more about how you can also support the school. Public health is having a global moment. No one needs to be told that, but on a positive note, maybe your friends and family also understand for the first time what it is we do in public health and how critical it is. I hope that you'll join me today in considering making your gift to support the school so that we can continue to respond to this crisis as well as other public health emergencies. Now let's jump into it and get to why we're all here today for our esteemed panel, A Crisis Compounded, How the Public Health, how the global pandemic is creating greater humanitarian challenges. This is a chance for us to hear from our world-renowned expert panelists about how the pandemic, the economic shutdown, and the various natural and human-made crises are impacting those who are most vulnerable. So let me get to the introductions of our distinguished panel. Today we have with us the Right Honorable David Miliband, President and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. In his role, Mr. Miliband oversees the agency's relief and development operations in over 30 countries, its refugee resettlement and assistance programs throughout the United States, and the IRC's advocacy efforts in Washington and across the globe on behalf of the world's most vulnerable people. David served as the youngest foreign secretary in three decades, driving advancement in human rights and representing the United Kingdom throughout the world. In 2016, David was named one of the world's greatest leaders by Fortune Magazine. And in 2018, he was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. David is also the author of the book, Rescue, Refugees and the Political Crisis of Our Time. Next, we have Dr. Mary T. Bassett. With more than 30 years of experience in public health, Dr. Bassett has dedicated her career to advancing health equity. Dr. Bassett is currently the director of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University, as well as the FXB professor of the practice of health and human rights at the Harvard Chan School. Prior to joining the FXB Center, she served as New York City's Commissioner of Health from 2014 to 2018. Next, we have with us, calling all the way in from Australia, Dr. Subramaniam Sivam, also known as Dr. Subra, so that we don't have to trip over his name. He is the Fall 2021 Richard L. and Ronnie A. Minchel Senior Leadership Fellow at the Harvard Chan School. 
Dr. Subra was a former member of parliament in the Malaysian House of Representatives, serving from 2004 to 2018. From 2004 to 2008, he was also appointed as the parliamentary secretary for the Ministry of Housing and Local Government. Subsequently, he was appointed as the Minister of Human Resources of Malaysia from 2008 to 2013. In this role, Dr. Subra was instrumental in the introduction of minimum wage and brought forward many reforms to protect workers throughout Malaysia. As the health minister, serving from 2013 to 2018, he made major reforms to the health system, particularly aimed at addressing the issues of non-communicable diseases and sustainability of health financing. He was also the vice president of the World Health Organization and the chairman of the Western Pacific Regional Office of the WHO. Lastly, I'd like to introduce today's moderator for our discussion, Dr. Howard Koh, the Harvey Feinberg Professor of Practice of Public Health Leadership at the Harvard Chan School and the Harvard Kennedy School. Dr. Koh previously served as the 14th Assistant Secretary for the US Department of Health and Human Services in the Obama administration as well as the Commissioner of Public Health for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Clearly, we have an incredibly distinguished panel with us here today, and we hope that we'll have some, in, some time at the end of the discussion where I'll be monitoring the chat and I'll take those questions at the end. But for now, Dr. Ko, I'll hand it over to you. Natalie, thank you so much for that very kind introduction and welcome everybody. It's a great honor to be moderating this distinguished panel. And let me thank all the alumni of the school. This remains still a fantastic public health school, a global treasure. It's a great honor to be a professor here and to welcome you to this very exciting weekend. I wanna give a special thanks to Dr. David Rogers and the whole alumni office. David reached out to me many months ago for this event and he's been meticulous in planning it. So thank you so much for organizing this. As Natalie mentioned, I'm a professor here at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Uh, very involved in COVID issues right now, like all of us are. And so I'm very grateful that we have such an esteemed panel of experts who could address some perspectives about COVID and other crises related to public health in this critical time in our globe's history. Uh, throughout the panel this morning, if you'd like to pose a question, please use the Q&A function. Uh, we hope to have some time at the end to answer some questions from you. Uh, we're also including some links to the chat box where you can read more about what's being discussed today and about other initiatives. And everybody registered for today's panel will be, following, uh, be followed up with a email. So I'm gonna be asking a number of questions to the panelists until about 1140. I'm gonna ask each of you to be as succinct as possible because we have many questions to go through and, and pose to you. Uh, and then at 11.40, I will have to move on to another session, but Natalie will kindly take over and ask questions. So uh, please send questions to her. So let's get started. Uh, as we all know too well, the pandemic has been especially hard on those who have the least access to healthcare, for the poor, low income, and the underserved. And on top of that, worldwide, we're seeing natural disasters, public emergencies, climate change, political and military conflicts. All those themes are exacerbating health disparities and health outcomes as well. And then in, in the midst of all this, we're seeing economic fallout and many, many challenges from vulnerable populations. So this first question is to the entire panel. Of all the ways COVID-19 and the ripple effects of the economic shutdown have affected the world's most vulnerable people, what concerns you the most. So Dr. Bassett, can we start with you? Not sure I hear you. Uh, I can't wait till I do a panel where I don't forget to unmute myself. So thanks very much. And it's a real pleasure to be here today. And thank you, uh, Professor Ko, for all that you've done. Uh, in confronting COVID. I've been focused mainly domestically. So I'm gonna talk about that. We, we have talked about the real burden on uh, between countries. And I, I think we have panelists who can talk about the impact on the developing world. I think when I first heard about COVID 
And China, I thought, you know, I don't know how people live there. Uh, maybe there are 15 people in a room in some of the areas where, um, uh, you know, where they're supporting production uh, in Wuhan. Uh, but of course, we have people in the United States who live 15 people a room. And what this pandemic has shown us in this country, where we have now passed the 200,000 mark in terms of numbers of deaths, is the real inequalities that exist uh, within our country and the excess uh, vulnerability that we've seen, uh, particularly among people of color, particularly people of African descent, but also Latinos, indigenous people who have several fold higher risk of getting sick and of dying. I think that I'd like to say a brief word and then I'll turn it over to others uh, about the word vulnerability. Uh, because I think sometimes when we use that word, we're talking about something that we see as innate to individuals. There's something about them. When in fact, the vulnerability, I would argue, has been displayed in our societal functions, the way in which we assure access to ha affordable housing, to uh, to job protections uh, and to health care. Uh, all of these are not are what contribute to vulnerability, not something inherent in people. Mary, thank you so much for starting us off. Uh, Dr. Subra, some quick reactions from you. Thank you, Owen. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Right, okay. I just would like to take um, something which actually touched my heart when first I read about it is the, the plight which was faced by uh, these migrant workers in India when they were suddenly there was a lockdown and uh, a lot of them were actually living in uh, uh, slum areas in uh, low uh, cost housing areas and when they came from villages and towns four or five hundred miles away some even thousand miles away when suddenly there was a lockdown everything in their life came to a halt. For example, many of them decided to go back to their villages and because the transportation was all stopped, uh, there we have we had this horrendous story of how many of them actually walked hundreds of miles and those uh, who did not get care of COVID, some of them actually got perished on the way uh, because of the toll which it took in their walking along so many, uh, so many hundreds of miles. And these were people who did not have any resources at all because they were, daily uh, wage earners uh, whose wages just lasted for them a day. And at the time of the lockdown, many of them actually had uh, half a day's savings, which was to last them for the entire lockdown. And uh, against this background, uh, uh, they had uh, uh, risk, not only risk of loss of job, uh, inability to go back to their to their places and even when they reach their places uh, they face the discrimination of people who actually brought uh, the virus from the uh, urban centers to the villages so this one incident actually in many way in a way is uh, the multifaceted problems which actually came out of this uh, this crisis of uh, of uh, how, how life entirely came to a halt and changed 100% uh, overnight, because when the, over, the the lockdown was announced overnight, everything ch changed overnight for them because this was done without any prior warnings or, or for them to do. So this, I took, I took this incident because it actually manifested uh, many of the inequities and problems which existed in society and how crisis actually brings this up. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Dr. Subra. President Miliband? Thanks very much. So the International Rescue Committee is a global humanitarian charity. We were actually founded by Albert Einstein in the 1930s. I'm sorry to report that he was a, a fellow of Princeton rather than Harvard. I don't know what Harvard's uh, recruitment policy was like at the time, but they somehow missed him. But I hope you don't hold that against him. Um, <laughs> we now operate in, uh, as I say, 40 countries, 200 uh, field sites, about 30,000 staff um, who are trying to help some of the most vulnerable people in the world, those who are displaced by conflict and disaster, we try to help them survive, recover, and gain control of their lives. I want to give a very simple and in some ways surprising message about the COVID crisis. The truth is that the health effects have been less bad 
than we feared, and the economic effects worse than we feared. This is not to say that there are no health effects, that would be ridiculous, nor is it to ignore the massive testing difficulties that create an absolute fog of war in many of the places that we work, in Yemen, in Northeast Nigeria, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, there's so little testing, it's very hard to see how much COVID there is. But I can report to you from our health centers around the world, we're not being inundated uh, in the way that we uh, feared. I don't want to under underestimate it, nor do I want anyone to forget that the interruption of immunization and vaccination campaigns is a very, very serious uh, threat to longer term health. However, net net, the health effect has been less than we feared, but the economic effect has been greater. You'll have seen that the UN is predicting 70 to 100 million people plunged into extreme poverty. That means living on less than $1.90 a day. Uh, other UN agencies talking about half a billion people uh, being dropped into a, a, a more a broader uh, definition of poverty. And World Food Programme talking about famine returning in a number of places. Uh, and I think it's those economic consequences that are currently front of mind and are the most um, salient answer to your uh, question. Of course, what we don't know is the second six months of the uh, disease, but there does seem to be a lot of asymptomatic spread uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. And of course, the Southern Hemisphere is going into the summer months. Some of the Southern Hemisphere, or certainly the African part of it, has a much younger population, which has provided some protection against some of the problems that Dr. Bassett and uh, Dr. Uh, Subra have mentioned. Thank you so much. So. Even after one question, we have some fascinating responses from the panel. Some thoughts about vulnerability and equities in the United States from Dr. Bassett. Some comments about migrant populations in India, and then uh, some broad global comments from President Miliband, not just about Einstein and Princeton, but about that overwhelming economic impacts. So here, here's another question for all of you. Uh, we all understand we're in month 10 of the pandemic worldwide. Uh, we've seen all, every country wrestle with this with so many challenges. And then there are other concomitant natural disasters and conflicts. Let me just mention one that has gotten global attention, the disaster with the explosion in Beirut, Lebanon last month, which has um, brought even more attention to the challenges uh, in, in that part of the world. So as we watch this pandemic progress over many months, this question is for all of you. Uh, how are the challenges different now than at the beginning of the pandemic? And Dr. Bassett, let me start with you again. Uh, thanks. So, uh, you know, I think one of the challenges that we face is that people get tired of, uh, of following uh, public health advice. And the other, as, um, as, as David Miliband has outlined, is that people are desperate to support their families and will take risks in order to support their families, uh, meaning going out to work in settings where social distancing may not be possible. Um, so I, you know, the long haul um, is, um, is, is very worrying indeed because the most effective um, reduction of transmission has occurred by simply telling people not to move around. And that is untenable uh, as a long-term strategy. Uh, the answer, I think, is to open the coffers and to, uh, you know, we have countries that have a, a lot of money, including our own, uh, and to support people through this period uh, and to offset the huge costs that are being borne financially uh, Worst of all, by the by, poor people. Fascinating. Okay, great, Dr. Subra. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> Dr. Subra can't hear you. Yeah, you can. I can. Go ahead. Right. Okay. Uh, yes, David. Uh, uh, how it? Uh, uh, towards the beginning of the pandemic, when we first start, the entire focus of the the uh, of the government and the people at that particular time was how they were going to overcome the virus. And uh, so at that time, there was this uh, compliance uh, with anything which the government had said. So in which we can actually reduce the transmission of the virus and reduce the number of cases. As time goes by, then the economic reality of the, of the virus, the, the restrictions and the lockdown came into being. 
and governments were forced into uh, governments started announcing uh, uh, economic uh, relief packages, uh, social security benefits. And as time goes by, uh, then the third problem was, of course, how are you going to reopen the economy? I, I found that a lot of governments found it easier to create a lockdown and found it more difficult to actually remove the lockdown. Uh, because uh, while imposing a lockdown uh, was by public health uh, announcements, but when you are trying to remove a lockdown, then you're doing it, trying to balance both the public requirements and the economic requirements. And there was no clear cut formula uh, which uh, governments can actually could follow, how are you going to remove it? And again, when you were trying to do it, there were economic activities which were uh, easy to be restored to normalcy. Uh, there were also other economic activities which were considered risks. And there was this uh, big problem in trying to stratify uh, which are the high risk ones, which are the low risk ones before you can open an economy. So as to balance between these, these, these three entities, one of course controlling the disease, and allowing people to actually go out and work and actually earn their livelihood. And thirdly, of course, ensuring that that process of going back to work is not actually going to endanger them to greater risk of getting the disease. So I think the later part of the, of the pandemic, uh, this triple issues actually became more complicated, uh, both for policymakers, for governments, and of course, for the people who want to actually be involved in activities. Thank you. Thank you, that's fascinating. President Miliband? Well, I think both of my co-panelists have made some really important points. We have about 800 staff in uh, Lebanon, the country that you mentioned, Professor Ko, 500 employees and 300 a day uh, volunteers. I think there's no question, first of all, that fatigue and stress are an important part of our management challenge at the moment, not least for our own uh, staff. The, the, uh, the impositions that have been made to try to keep the disease at bay um, have been a, a real challenge for any organization that's seeking business continuity. Secondly, the secondary and tertiary effects of the uh, disease, um, both on the economy and on uh, wider uh, health, I think are increasingly clear. Those uh, weren't the case in the emergency response at the beginning. And I, the thing I would add is that I think for the countries that we work in, we're looking at three, four, five years. I mean, listening to the debate, so-called debate last night, and the idea that the vaccine is going to be all done uh, within the next uh, six months. In the places that we work and the people that we help, uh, we're looking at a multi-year challenge of getting this uh, vaccine properly distributed once it's um, discovered. And you would know better than I, Professor Ko, that there are big issues about the extent to which this virus will mutate and will need successive vaccines uh, each uh, year. So I, I think we mustn't underestimate quite how long this will be with us. I just want to raise one other point, which is that rather counterintuitively, uh, the disease, far from producing more international cooperation, is actually producing less. Uh, the talk of vaccine nationalism, I think, is extremely alarming. Uh, obviously, there's the decision of the US administration to pull out of the World Health Organization. It suggests that at a time when the world is confronted with a disease that is a precisely a disease of the connected world, the danger is that there is disconnection. Now, if I understand it rightly, in the scientific and academic community, there's actually thick uh, developmental and uh, cooperation across national boundaries. But the backlash in politics is not one that gives me uh, too much confidence at the moment, and I think needs to be fought against very, very hard if those secondary and tertiary impacts are to be mitigated. Mm. Well, this is fascinating. What I'm hearing from all three of you is the theme that initially people thought this was an acute crisis, but now we're all realizing that this is a chronic crisis that's spilling over into every sector of society, challenges of reopening societies, the economic impacts, uh, ramifications with respect to global collaboration on a potential future vaccine. So th this is getting even more complicated. And so this is, <laughs> this is where we need everyone's public health expertise more uh, than ever before. So Dr. Bassett, let me move on to a specific question for you. Here in the US, uh, you know so well that the pandemic and the economic shutdown has disproportionately affected the poor, people of color, those who work in crowded cities, uh, those who can't afford to stop working. Uh, we wonder what will happen if and when a COVID becomes available. 
how, how do we best support those disproportionately affected by the pandemic and economic shutdown uh, once this pandemic is hopefully behind us? Well, I think we know now that the cities were just the en entry point. They were the gateway for uh, the spread of COVID and because of their connectedness. These are the international travel hubs and so on. Uh, but we are now seeing in the United States uh, COVID across the nation in the heartland affecting urban, suburban, and, uh, and rural communities. And, uh, and the hard hit New York City, uh, although it, just recently they've announced an uptick, you know, had, had, had a real experience of decline and reduced transmission related to quite stringent measures. Within uh, the uh, a fact that this is a universal phenomenon uh, affecting the entire globe, of course, we're seeing huge inequities. And in the United States, the risk of dying for African Americans, when you take into account age, is between three and fourfold higher, not, not only in cities, but in all, all the settings. And for uh, Indigenous people and Latinx community, that risk is rising. Uh, and uh, very worryingly so. Uh, so this reflects not some sort of inherent biological difference between these communities and white communities. Uh, it reflects the, what it means to be from a racial minority in the United States in terms of where you live, what your access to numbers of services are, what your work status is and your ability to work from home. All of these are, are um, work against people being able to protect themselves. And I think it's highlighted the fact that we need to have worker protection, uh, that people shouldn't have to go to work in settings where they can't stay away from other people, where they can't wear face masks and where they can't wash their hands. On, on American Indian reservations like the Navajo Nation, uh, something like 30% of households don't have piped water. I think people don't understand that this kind of poverty exists in the United States, but it does. Thank you so much, Mary. So President Miliband, uh, you head the International Rescue Committee, IRC. You've given us some broad comments on your efforts as head of the IRC. Uh, and then particularly through COVID-19, you are seeing how this health crisis is affecting so many countries, compounded by weak health systems and the economic lockdown. So these are multiple emergencies going on at once. From your vantage point, what, what are the global lessons to be learned from the work from IRC right now? Well, I think there's three or four. First, to state the obvious, in an interconnected world, weak links in the global public health chain are a threat to us all. I think you've written about this, Professor, probably more than I have. But unless we take care of the fact that 3 billion people around the world don't have access to running water, we're going to be running risks for the global system. Uh, second uh, lesson or second point, that trust is the most precious commodity in fighting a health crisis. We work, for example, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, we have a lot of experience of infection prevention and control in respect of Ebola. And we know that if you don't have the trust of the local community, then you will simply not be able to deliver services. We've, today we face disinformation, so-called fake news in many places as well. And I think the way in which trust has been lost in too many places um, has undoubtedly hampered the efforts to get the disease under control. Thirdly, uh, again, perhaps to state the obvious, so I apologize if this is undergraduate rather than PhD level, but prevention is better than cure. And the fact that the frontline preventative health response has been dramatically underfunded. Everyone wants to fund vaccine research. No one wants to fund hand washing, fever testing, isolation centers. I mean, that is criminally stupid as well as immoral. And uh, we know that the UN appeal, a, a mere $10 billion compared to the $8 trillion that's been invested in the richest economies to subsidize those economies, to keep those economies going, that $10 billion UN appeal has only been 24% funded, $2.4 billion, and only 15% of that $2.4 billion has found its way to the frontline NGOs who are doing the hand washing stations, the fever testing, the isolation centers. So although prevention is better than cure is an old cliche, it's not actually being 
followed in the way in which the public health response is being run. And that worries me a lot. Uh, the US, so if you ask me for three lessons, I'd, I'd throw those into the discussion. Uh, thanks so much. Those are great. What a uh, ringing endorsement of our public health mission right now. So Dr. Super, next question is for you. Uh, governments are dealing with the biggest fiscal deficits in decades. Uh, can you speak to how this has impacted how governments are giving support to those in most need and what can they do about it? Thank you, Harvard. Uh, I think uh, as far as governments are concerned, uh, they don't have any choice, but actually have to come forward and uh, provide the necessary support uh, to the people at this very crucial of times, uh, despite the risk of having to worsen their fiscal deficit. In our own country, I think uh, the government had to roll out uh, assistance. Uh, and of course, this resulted in uh, increasing of the fiscal deficit by nearly 2%. But this is something which is a responsibility of the governments at this particular point in time so as to actually alleviate the huge problems which the people are facing. And just to prototype uh, the type of assistance which governments uh, probably have to roll out at this, at this crisis, it will involve uh, a few axes. One, of course, the first thing is ensuring that the health system is sufficiently funded and has got enough resources uh, to actually manage, contain, and mitigate the impact of the disease itself. And this is very important because there are many elements to this. One is, of course, uh, uh, contact tracing, uh, diagnosis, testing, uh, quarantine and treatment, and uh, offering the facilities to frontliners, ensuring hospitals are sufficiently equipped. Uh, so that is the first thing. Number two, of course, is, of course, uh, how are you going to protect the, the people? Uh, and uh, number three is, of course, how are you going to stabilize and stimulate the economy so it can continue go can continue uh, within the limits of what is happening now, so that people can have a right of job at least the jobs are preserved. Along this line, uh, as far as the Malaysian concern, government is concerned, just about one month after the the first introduction of COVID in our country, uh, the government announced uh, stimulus and fiscal packages addressing these three components that is uh, aimed at one, it's protecting the people. Number two is protecting businesses. And number three is how to stimulate economy. So as far as protecting the people is concerned, of course, amongst one of the main things, of as I said, strengthening the health system. Number two was protecting them for sudden catastrophe in terms of uh, social security, uh, providing of uh, handouts in various forms, uh, enabling the poor to continue to have uh, adequate housing uh, and the provision of utilities uh, and of course uh, ensuring this adequate amount of food security and uh, furthermore of course to ensure that businesses can survive uh, by ensuring they got enough capital uh, talking to banks so that the, the loans can be rationalized or postponed moratorium on the paying back of uh, loans and uh, at the same time, uh, trying the government itself investing uh, into the economy so as to uh, provide greater opportunities, uh, which can produce a ripple effect on the economy. I think this is the prototype which probably uh, is, was used uh, by a lot of countries uh, in trying to make sure uh, there was support to the people at this point in time. Of course, there is a challenge to this in the sense that whether the finances of a country, the economic situation of country allows them to do it, but there's an issue which has to be, to be, to be managed first by the government itself. And that is where I think uh, we have been talking too much of international collaboration and support, how the richer countries can come and assist the poorer countries. So this kind of assistance can be given. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subra. Uh, what a fascinating panel you are, and uh, this is very inspiring to hear your responses and the, the broad, broad perspectives that all three of you have. So uh, now it's time to hear some questions from the audience. Uh, I apologize that I'll have to leave to join the next panel, but I just want to tell you how honored I've been to moderate uh, this discussion and to hear from these 
inspiring global experts, and to, again, thank the alumni of this great school. We are so lucky to have your support and leadership. So let me turn this back over to Natalie, and thank you so much for having me today. Thanks so much, Dr. Ko. Um, and he's a busy man jumping over to another Zoom meeting. And uh, this has just been such a wonderful panel and such a great discussion. Um, having a hard time choosing which questions to get to because there's so many great ones. But let's start with one that came in from the chat about how will vaccines be distributed? Who should be given priority? Frontline health workers, military, government employees, and what would your advice be for how government should think about this process? Um, I'll leave that question open to the full panel if anyone wants to take that. Well, I guess uh, we'll stick to the order that Howard had yeah. set us up with, and I'll, I'll take a go first. Uh, uh, the, the first question, of course, is, uh, is that we, we want to see the vaccine made broadly available. and. Uh, and of course, everybody uh, is, is hoping fervently that we get a, a safe and effective vaccine soon. My own view is that uh, in the United States, we've all talked about the racial ethnic disparities in COVID risk and in COVID uh, deaths. Uh, but I don't believe that vaccines should be targeted in that way. Uh, David uh, has mentioned the loss of trust. And uh, there is within the United States, a loss of trust uh, by communities that have a history of discrimination and marginalization. My own view is that it should be targeted according to the work that people do and according to the personal risk that they have because of their own disease status. And of course, uh, you know, it should be available globally at a cost that uh, is affordable to the entire world. Um, uh, and this is something that remains very uncertain at the moment. Uh, groups like Gavi, the Global um, Access to Vaccines Initiative, I think I've got that acronym right, is having active discussions about how to ensure that the vaccine is not only uh, made available in wealthy countries, uh, but in, in any case, and, and that seems to me a, a prime initial challenge is to make sure that it's available uh, to the entire world. Dr. Subra, you, Your Excellency, do you want to go next? Sorry. My... Doctor, there you go. Okay, I'm clear now. Right, I think I agree with Mary. For, for, for a long time, uh, market forces have been playing a big role uh, whenever anything innovative has come, uh, whether it be vaccines or new kind of medications. Uh, this is a time where the, in the whole world is looking at the scene and see how more of kind of social equity will come into popular forefront rather than market forces. Because if you leave it to the market forces of the pharmaceutical industry, uh, then of course, uh, if it's going to be the old story, then it will be the rich will be the ones who are getting better and the richer nations will get greater access than the poorer nations. But here is a case of equity, who is going to be protected the most. I think it's important for a very strong international discussion and collaboration like what uh, Mary had said just now, I think Gavi has taken upon it, and there's a lot of discussion going on between manufacturers, countries. I think some kind of understanding can be reached in the international community to ensure access to all nations, uh, immaterial of the economic stating and within nations to identify people who are most vulnerable and who require it most. So they ensure that that category of people get the vaccine first. And, and then of course, as it's possible, uh, increase access to the greater community. So I think, I hope the distribution of the vaccine once it's available will be based on this uh, premises of equity and uh, social fairness uh, to nations and to the people who probably most need it. Thank you, Natalie. I would add a couple of things. First of all, much as I would like the vaccine. I'm afraid people like me are not either in a vulnerable group 
or in an essential worker group. And those seem to me to be the two prime categories in whatever country they live in. Uh, health and other essential workers come first. Uh, vulnerable groups who are above all are the elderly um, come, uh, come, come above, come in priority. Obviously the great danger is that wealth is the determinant of who gets the vaccine. And that's a, a, a chronic danger. Um, the World Health Organization launched a campaign last year for universal health coverage. And obviously that is met, um, is not met at all. Um, gross uh, differences in uh, health uh, access around the world. But the distribution of the vaccine provides one way to try to push against that inequality. In terms of its distribution, I think there is an important point. Uh, the first round of the Millennium Development Goals between 20, 2000 and 2015 made progress using government systems. But the truth about extreme poverty today, not, notwithstanding the very real points that Dr. Bassett has made about the situation in the United States, the extreme poor around the world today live in conflict and uh, fragile and conflict affected states, about 50% of the world's extreme poor living on less than $1.90 uh, a day. And you cannot rely on government systems in those places because government is either the problem or it's non-existent. And in those areas, we're gonna to have to develop bespoke mechanisms using civil society, using community distribution, using community health workers to make sure that we get a genuinely global blanket when it comes to vaccine distribution. Great, thank you so much for that. A lot of good responses and a lot to think about in terms of uh, type of workers and access and how we can make it broadly available. The next question I wanna to get to comes to us from a physician. And I think it's something that every single person here on the panel, as well as watching at home can definitely relate to. But how do we address this uh, concept of burnout that everyone is experiencing globally? From physicians to environmental services, to grocery store workers, to parents who are now balancing full-time jobs while virtually schooling their children. Uh, this person in particular is a pediatrician and she is also starting to see more cases of non-accidental trauma, intimate partner violence, uh, which unfortunately, as we all know, are something that consequences that go hand in hand with economic stress. Um, so I'd like to ask the whole panel that question again and start with you, Dr. Bassett. Well, this is something that is documented that we're seeing rising rates of um, of inter intimate partner violence, uh, concerns about uh, harms to children, parents using overly, um, you know, stern disciplinary approaches, parents under stress because of caretaking responsibilities, because of lack of work, um, uh, if they've lost their jobs. Um, so I, you know, I I wish I knew an an answer to this. The uh, the this is obviously. Um, not in people's heads. This is related to the real circumstances of their lives. And I think the part of it has to be for people who are continuing to work that employers be aware uh, of the stresses that are placed on individuals, that there be supports to people, opportunities to talk about the stresses that they're facing. And uh, it unfortunately shows in addition to the many gaps we have in access to services for physical health, um, the real deficits that we have around the globe for access to services for mental health. Um, and uh, uh, so that leaves us with strategies like public campaigns to tell people that, that what they're feeling, they're not alone and things of that nature. Um, so I hope that my fellow panelists have a, um, have a, a more explicit response to offer, uh, but this is definitely something that we have to look to as we go forward. People need reprieves from the stresses that they're experiencing. So, uh, I, uh, Dr. Subra, do you uh, want to add to that? Thanks, Mary. Uh, I I totally agree with what uh, Mary said. I think uh, in, in generally, I think in most countries, uh, mental health has not been given that degree of importance it's ought to be given. And this is the kind of crisis which actually brings into form uh, the, the importance of mental health in managing uh, a very 
stressful and multi-conflict type of situation like this. And uh, I don't think we have, uh, on a global basis, have gone through a situation like this for many, many years. So it has actually probably highlighted to nations in the manage, in, in the in the whole definition of health. While we have been given tremendous amount of importance to physical health, uh, the, the element of mental health has been uh, put behind. And I think uh, now it's manifesting in, in a situation which of course triggered by a disease, but the social con consequences of this has created a lot of uh, stress and to which uh, different people have got different coping mechanisms. And those who actually are not able to cope up with it, they're falling victims to this, uh, are seeing the results of what you have actually said just now, naturally. So going back, I think it is important because uh, to people have to prepare people. So they have got ability to manage this kind of stressful situations and how these coping mechanisms can be provided. Well, that is for the future. For the time being, I think uh, we have to recognize the existence of this and how within the current services which are given, apart from the management of disease, this is one component can be looked into to ensure that people are given this type of guidance and assistance which is needed for them where, uh, at this moment to ensure that uh, the, the consequences of the disease doesn't disrupt their lifestyle uh, leading to what you have better have described just now. Thank you. Yeah, I think that this is a, a very real issue for us as a major employer. We, we have 13,000 employees and 17,000 volunteers. And so the issues uh, of weariness, of fatigue, of stress that have been referred to are certainly what we're seeing in our work around the world. We've had significant increase in the um, access to counseling that we offer to all uh, employees. And I think that um, with people, they've got kids running out of, in and out of their places where they're working from. I mean, it's a, it, it's a time when anyone who's in a managerial position has to, above all, remember to remain a human being before they're a manager. And that means going with the flow of the different strains and stresses that people are, are facing. Uh, I have no magic bullet or magic uh, answer uh, to this, uh, but the most important thing is to recognize it. And it's a very good test of whether the rhetoric about mental health being as important as physical health is ever turned into reality. We're trying to, to do that in the way in which we run the International Rescue Committee, uh, but um, there's a lot to learn. Great, thank you, Sri. I know that hopefully provides a little bit of comfort and just all of us recognizing globally what we're experiencing. Um, I have a lot of questions coming in about vaccines, but uh, tomorrow's morning's panel is all on vaccines. So I'm gonna save some of those. Um, maybe that's a teaser for everyone to tune in tomorrow as well. Um, and the next question I'm going to ask is that there seems to be no coherent answer to the question of returning children to school mm -hmm. uh, in person or not. And I think each country and each state and each county is dealing with this differently. And that will really be a key component to this economic recovery and addressing these mental health issues. Um, so I'd like to hear from the panel of how you think that we should be addressing this. I'll start with you again, Dr. Bassett. Sure, and this has been a really tough issue uh, because uh, of course everybody is very uh, concerned about the safety of their children, uh, that this is, uh, if there's anyone in our society uh, to whom we owe the greatest uh, uh, obligation for protection, it's children. And we want teachers to be safe, teachers may be older, uh, and uh, that said, I, I, I think that the cost of keeping schools closed is extremely high. It will replicate inequities. In fact, it's already doing that in the United States and children are deprived of access to learning. Uh, they may um, have very differing capacity to participate in the virtual remote learning opportunities that are being offered and uh, families with more resources can offer uh, supplementary education opportunities. So the, the gaps in educational attainment seem uh, definitely likely to widen both within and between countries. And additionally, of course, parents you know, are accustomed to having their kids have some place to go and it's very important to any working parent. Um, so that said, uh, where it's possible to do so safely, 
Uh, it's that meaning that transmission within the surrounding communities is low. Uh, I, I think that schools are endeavoring to reopen. Some are opting for hybrid schedules, but this remains a very you know, uncertain area and one in which we're gonna learn a lot by the varied models that are being used to make uh, learning possible for, for children. Um, so, you know, it's, we have to remember that we're still just months into this pandemic and the answers are not always completely clear. Thanks, Dr. But given Sarah, that, I think you? when we can, we, it's really important to get kids back to school. Uh, remote yeah. learning as many, you know, just as this conversation, we're all doing our best, but it's not the same as a conversation where if we were all sitting at a table together, certainly learning is much more complex when it's being offered remotely without the possibility of direct and involved in, you know, direct conversations with either your classmates or your teacher. Absolutely. So a note to get back to school in person when we can safely. Dr. When it's safe. Sandra, yeah, it's we need to, when it's safe. Um, I mean, there are examples, right, um, that we can learn from. Sweden has maintained its elementary schools open. Um, and Israel had uh, amplification of transmission related to continued uh, opening of schools. So we we are going to see different efforts and we'll learn from them. Thank you. Dr. Subra, any thoughts to add on that? Yes, uh, Natalia, I think, uh, I think Mary had very clearly uh, defined what are the challenges of this because uh, on one hand, there's a desire of everybody that school should be reopened. On the other hand, is to ensure that the, uh, the child is not going to be or exposed to any added risk when they go back to school and whether the home is school environment is going to be a safer environment than home. And third point, of course, is, uh, is uh, go, sending children to school has become part and parcel of how we have, people have uh, designed their lives. So when that changes, then the life pattern, not only of the child, but the parents and the entire community actually changes. Uh, in this, I just want to add two two other points, which are very. One is that uh, in 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 uh, low income countries uh, 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 and in the poorer communities, uh, the daily meal which was provided by schools mm -hmm. has formed the one important meal for them, uh, and uh, ne nearly two hundred and seventy million children all over the world actually benefit from these uh, meals programs in schools. So when schools were closed, they de denied this nutrition. And uh, this is one, one very important way how closing of schools is affected, not only education, but uh, food and nutrition on the other aspect. The other point of course on equity, while uh, the one option of continuing schooling was by online teaching and uh, virtual teaching, but again, the, the capacity to own the tools necessary to ensure this can happen is not widespread everywhere. Uh, one, either they don't have the facilities, they don't have the uh, computer or laptop or whatever is, is needed to ensure that can be done. Or secondly, they, uh, the huge number of them actually stay in areas in which there's no connectivity. So in that sense, I think uh, this whole disruption to the school system, which has been caused by this COVID, had actually brought in COVID and uh, to brought in the inequities which are so uh, uh, deeply entrenched in society. And, uh, and uh, uh, there have been reports, of course, uh, particularly in African countries where there's gender equality has been exemplified when girls don't go to school and there's a possibility they might not return to school at all. So these are the challenges which, uh, which we face uh, when schools are closed, but like what Mary said, there's no simple answer to this. I think the ideal is everybody has to go back to school in a safe environment, and we hope that formula can be found. Thank you. Look, I agree that it's not simple, but it's also not rocket science. I mean, the basics are clear. It's about testing, it's about washing your hands, it's about wearing face masks, and it's about social distance, which is obviously the most difficult thing in a 1500 to 2000 
person high school or even the 300 person uh, primary school. That's why you need in those circumstances, invention and innovation uh, to take up other community facilities to spread the load. And so I think what you'll see is that frankly, the disaster in large parts of the US in terms of the spread of the disease is replicated with the situation in respect to the schools. But those countries that are, and actually those states that are taking adult health care seriously are also managing their school transition effectively. And if you look at some of the European countries, uh, they've shown that while it's not easy, it's not rocket science, but you've got to be able to test. You've got to take the mask wearing and the public health like washing hands seriously. And you've got to make sure that there is a culture that um, ensures mutual responsibility. And so I think there are some good examples of that. It's very good that Dr. Bazet raised the Israeli example because they allowed kids back to school without proper precautions and they refueled the disease. So that again is not rocket science. It's, it's about uh, rational, thoughtful, informed and transparent public policy making. Great, thank you. Those are some great responses. I know we're coming up on time, but we did start a couple minutes late, so. I want to finish on hopefully a high note. I think that things can be a little bit overwhelming during the pandemic and realizing how interconnected our economy and health and the weaknesses in our systems are. So I would love to hear from each of you on what would you want to see in the future that would help to equalize the system and eliminate health disparities, starting again with Dr. Bassett. Well, I, I, you know, the list is so long and listening to my, my fellow panelists, I, I just feel such a deep sense of sadness about the US response. Uh, and uh, we've seen a denigration of science, uh, 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 all sorts of actions that seem designed to undermine public trust and public health uh, and indeed in government in general. Uh, so I, I would love to see uh, a, an agreement that we should have public health leadership when we face a pandemic. And that we in public health, uh, of course, need to remind people that we need to have testing. We need to have the ability to socially distance, mask wearing, hand washing, staying, you know, staying away from people, avoiding inside uh, socializing environments when we can. All that makes perfect sense. But we also need to lend our voices to the fact that people need access to a living wage, to affordable housing, to, uh, to access to healthcare, paid sick leave so that they don't go to work sick and make other people sick uh, because they can continue to draw a salary when they need to be homesick. All of these um, are, are, are really necessary. And I'm hopeful really that this experience will teach us and the United States is in the position to advocate this to the world, that we need to have a society in which these are the norms, that science is respected, and that we recognize that people have to have the ability to follow public health advice uh, and not blame it on them when they can't. Um, so that's my hope, that the silver lining will be a better world. Thank you for that, Dr. Bassett. Those are great, great advice and a strong resounding call for the importance of public health. Dr. Stubra? Uh, uh, in line with what was uh, stated by Mary just now, I think the WHO in its uh, uh, biennium program for 2020 and 2021 uh, has launched a program called the 3 billion program. That is how aimed at increases access uh, to ensure that 1 billion people in the world have got uh, universal health coverage, uh, 1 billion have are protected against health emergencies, and 1 billion have got better health uh, and social well being. And this is a very laudable project because it actually underlies many of the things which we talked about. Because it looks at how uh, WHO as a global coordinating body using uh, a collaboration with international agencies and support from 
uh, international bodies and countries can actually assist all nations in the world, particularly the less developed countries, to ensure that there is actually access to health care, to universal health uh, coverage, and ensure that countries are better prepared to actually deal with health emergencies like what we are facing now than before, uh, to ensure that they have the capacity to prevent epidemics and pandemics, and they have the capacity to rapidly detect such things and respond well. And apart from that, ensure that people have got better health and well-being by addressing, like what Mary said, the social determinants of health. For, for too long, public health has seen health in an isolated platform, not knowing that health is actually the net result of the failure of many of the social determinants. And as I think that program by, by itself, uh, conceptually, is a very, very good program. And I hope that uh, WHO will have the capacity, uh, both in terms of fiscal capacity and others, uh, through adequate kind of support globally, to actually ensure that the success of this program, uh, because it addresses most of the issues which we've been discussing tonight, and uh, or, or this afternoon, as where you are. So and. Uh, so I, I, to, to me, to end up, I hope that these programs can succeed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fubra. And David, your parting thoughts. Thanks very much. I mean, Dr. Bassett and uh, Dr. Zubra have spoken very well. I, I would uh, urge us, if we're allowed to do one thing, to, to be simple about this, to take the commitment to universal health coverage and then deliver on the basics. Because I think that unless we start with the basics, we're not going to be able to build an effective global healthcare system. And the world has made huge progress in the last 20 years in eliminating some of the biggest killer diseases by thinking simple and thinking from the perspective of the client. And often that's meant taking healthcare to the client. So it means challenging some of the medical assumptions and about who can make decisions and how they can make them. It means using community health workers as well as qualified medical staff. And it means building a system that genuinely provides the kind of uh, healthcare safety net that is so important. But we've got a long way to go. And my, my plea would be to start simple rather than to start complicated. That's what we try and do in our work. We have about 40% uh, of our work is healthcare related. It's often focused on, a, the, on women and girls, which is something we haven't talked about today. I think that the gender disparities in health access and health coverage an incredibly important part uh, of the uh, future. And um, I hope I put something in the chat, but I hope that the Harvard alumni community will be interested in uh, thinking not just about the situation in advanced industrialized country, countries, but also uh, helping some of the people in the most vulnerable parts of the world. You can see what we're doing at rescue.org, which is our uh, website. And uh, I, I think that it's that global vision that's going to be important in the world that we live in. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you all. And that concludes our panel. I think that was a great way to end on starting at home, starting simple, and how that expands out nationally and globally. Um, and we know that we need all those pieces in place in order for things to run smoothly. So I really want to thank our panelists. I I know I'm incredibly honored to be here and to get to ask you these questions and Hopefully everybody at home feels a little bit better hearing from these world experts and knowing that they're on the case helping to make our world a little bit better each day. Um, so thanks again for joining us. I want to remind everybody that we have panels again tomorrow and Friday at the same time, 11 a.m. Eastern. You can find details in the chat box and you'll be receiving emails. So thanks so much. Take care and please stay safe and healthy, everybody. <laughs>